Hood Church. Welcome. I hope you're having an amazing week. We have a special service planned. But first, I want to say that this is the last week that we are going through the message series called You're Wrong. If you've missed any of the past messages, you can hop on to mysummit.church and catch those. But if you have, if you've missed those, it's totally okay. You can hop in right here and it's going to be amazing. This is also the last week that we that we have Pastor Dave with us. We're going to be sending him off and Lori, we're going to be blessing them as they move to Tennessee. They're very excited in this next step in their journey and we're excited for them. Also, next month starts something special because it is July. We have our summit summer speakers coming and that also means that we have food trucks every single week. We're going to have some amazing refreshing treats after service. So make sure you come out and hang out with us. Let's hear more about what's going on at Summit. Hey guys, if you remember this time last year, we were doing this exact same thing, getting ready for the 4th of July Sunday service at Summit. And we're gonna do the same thing we did last year. We're giving away big bundles of fireworks. Well, with gas at almost $7 a gallon and inflation at almost 10%, you probably would love some help getting fireworks this year. Well, we're gonna do that, be here in service You'll get a raffle ticket and you'll win first, second, or third place, or nothing at all. And that's just as exciting as well. We'll see you back here next Sunday for our big fireworks giveaway. Good morning, Summit Church. My name is Dana Almora, and I'm so excited to share a resource with you today. We have 10 chaplains available for all of you. Before, during, and after service, we're available under the prayer flag. We're also available 24 hours a day with our 24-hour hotline. Call us. Allow us to stand alongside you in prayer. Allow us to encourage you. This is a difficult season for many, and it may be a difficult season coming up. Let us be there for you. We love you. We support you. We provide prayer. Please reach out to us. All right, we're going to have the ushers make their way forward. God bless you guys. Thank you for being here this morning. We're getting into that summer season. Kids are out of school, and parents are already really, really on edge about that. I can feel it. So if you have a kid in here with you right now, they should not be, they should be loving that we're starting Kid Craze, our version of VBS this morning. Yeah. So we've got a ton of volunteers that are out of this room helping Miss Heather with that. And uh, some of you guys are really thankful for that. That runs all the way through Wednesday. It's going to be amazing. If you didn't get your kids signed up, guess what? I heard Heather this week in the office say, I will never close registration. They can come at the very last minute. So I love that idea. And I love that you still have time to get your kids into kid craze, which is really, really good for them. So we're going to pray over our offering and uh, just want to tell you how grateful we are for not only your faithfulness and tithing, but we have two very special things happening right now. Convoy of Hope, which you guys are being amazingly responsive to. And then number two, Alejandra Medina, one of our own, is uh, recovering from a rare kind of cancer in which she had to get a bone marrow transplant in which they require you to sign a contract that you will have 24-hour care for about three straight months following. And if you don't, they won't do the transplant. So we had someone in our church who is literally willing, <clears throat> pardon me, to give up their job so that they can be with her 24 hours a day, seven days a week. But that's just an impossible ask to make of somebody. So we're believing that we're going to raise some money and we're going to be able to help pay for some of that care so we can give that person some relief. Amen? Amen. So you can, if you want to give to that specifically, you can just give to those in need. It's on your drop down in the app. Uh, under giving, you can go to the website, mysummit.church and give right there. But we're going to believe that God's going to multiply our tithes and our offerings for his kingdom's sake in Jesus name. Father, thank you for this opportunity to respond in obedience and respond in compassion, God. We want to see people's needs met. And we know that you give through us, not to us, but you give through us, God, so that we can be a blessing to others. And uh, in the meantime, God, you bless us and we thank you for that. We receive that. And then we pray that we're good stewards with that. And we believe for all of it in Jesus' name. Amen.
Uh, we have been for the last three weeks and now including today four weeks. Uh, and by the way, welcome to our online campus. These guys don't get enough attention from me. And so I want to welcome you guys. I'll look right into the camera and say, welcome to the online campus. Uh, we are looking forward to, we are working hard on getting this service streaming live on Sunday mornings at 1030. And uh, that takes a lot of work because of where we're at, we need to bring in extra internet to do that. And so we're working on that. We're working on a lot of things that are going to be really cool improvements on the way we do church around here. But anyway, we've been on this journey for now four weeks, uh, kind of an awkward one, if uh, I'm being honest, because it's the recognition and realization that we're wrong. That we're wrong, not no, yeah, <clears throat> yeah, you're wrong about being wrong. That we're wrong, not just some of the time on some things, we're wrong all of the time on everything. Here's what I mean. You can't possibly know all there is to know about any of the things that you think you know something about. You may know that this is a table and you may know maybe even the exact height of this table, but I promise there are elements and parts of this table, where it was manufactured, who touched it, what, what the properties of this table are, you don't know. So even the simplest things, there are still things we don't know about it. And on the things we do know about, the things that really matter in our lives, we don't know enough about those things because we've been passed incomplete information from people just like us who don't know. Like, for instance, one thing that they're saying now is that dinosaurs, if you've seen the new Jurassic movie, that there's a bunch of new dinosaurs that have feathers on them because now... Uh, 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 the researchers and scientists are now in agreement that they probably didn't have this leathery, uh, scaly skin, but now it was, they were covered in feathers. So th what we knew for a long time, we don't know that anymore. Now we know something completely new. So that which we knew was wrong or that which we know now is wrong, I can't figure it out. What I do know with certainty is that we're wrong all the time. But as followers of Christ, you would think the one thing we would want to be least wrong about, that we want to care whether or not we're wrong about, is the thing that we should be most right about. And that is what we know of God. Because what we know of God changes what we know of ourselves and what we know about each other. Now, I've got some good news for you, and I've got some bad news. <clears throat> Here's the good news. The good news is that there is an authoritative body of work that is perfect in its truth-telling of who God is. In the fact that God gave us everything he wanted us to know possibly that we're capable of knowing in this body of truth called the Bible. That's the good news. Now, there is bad news, though. The bad news is this. It not only reveals how perfect God is and how right God is. It gives us a picture of that. It does as good, if not a better job, of showing us how broken, how messed up, how finite, how sinful, how incomplete, and how wrong we are. And that means that even if the body of truth from which we learn what is right, we are so broken that we are bound to get that wrong. That's bad news. Because even if you have the manual that shows you everything about what it takes to be right and recognize right and do right and know right, you will still get it wrong. That's not blasphemy. That's not heresy. That's scripture. Listen to what it says in 1 Corinthians 13, 12. This is the Apostle Paul. He says, for now we can only see a dim and blurry picture of things as when we stare into a polished metal, or other translations will say, a foggy mirror. I realize that everything I know, everything I'm certain about, everything I've learned, all my knowledge is only part of the big picture. 
But one day when Jesus arrives, we will see clearly face to face. In that day, I will fully know just as I have been wholly known by God. Paul himself says, that which I know about God, that which I'm certain about, that which I've learned is only a small part of what there is to know. I'm just seeing bits and pieces. We don't get the whole picture. Only when Jesus comes, we're standing face to face with him. Will we know everything? So listen, we as followers of Christ only get part of it. The problem with that is that not only do we live our lives with a lot of broken information, a lot of incomplete information, a lot of wrong information. We spend a lot of our time focusing on all the wrong stuff instead of really working hard to get the right stuff right. Let me say that again. As followers of Christ, it has to be our intention to not get any of the wrong stuff right, but get the right stuff right. But we spend so much of our time really focusing on getting all the wrong stuff right that we don't spend any of our time getting all the right stuff right. Listen to what it says in 2 Timothy 2, I think it's 14 through 17. This is Paul writing to his protege, Timothy, a young leader in the church, and he says, continue teaching these things, warning people in God's presence not to argue. So he just went through right above this passage. Paul had just given Timothy this, like, Jesus died for us so we can be saved, and where we're incomplete, he's complete, and if we reject him, he rejects us, but if we accept him, he accepts us. He goes through these really, really basic fundamental declarations of truth and faith, and he says, you've got to keep teaching the simplicity of the gospel, get the right things right. Continue teaching these things, warning people in God's presence not to argue about, don't split hairs. Don't get caught up in stupid arguments. It does not help anyone, and, and it ruins those who listen. Make every effort to give yourself to God as the kind of person he will approve. Be a worker who's not ashamed and listen, who uses the true teaching in the right way, who uses the gospel, the truth of God's word in the proper way, because it can be used in the wrong way. Stay away from foolish, useless talk because that will lead people further away from God. Not only is it important that we get the right stuff right, but that we avoid the wrong stuff because we can actually cause people to move further from God when we misuse and abuse scripture and when we focus on the wrong things and when we apply the word of God wrongly. So we're going to spend just a couple minutes today and we've got a special ending today. We're going to be saying goodbye to a couple of our team and uh, we're going to celebrate them out. But I want to share some important truth with you in this last message of this series. And by the way, next week begins our summer refresher series with five amazing guest speakers who are going to absolutely kill it. John Pritikin, one of my close, close friends who is a giant, giant teddy bear is going to be here next week. And he's going to not only just share a word from God, but um, he's bringing his book that uh, I got to help kind of be a part of. And uh, he wrote his story in this book and a lot of encouragements in it. So bring a few extra bucks with you. John will have those books here for you. Number one, I get the rightest thing wrong when I forget who it's for and who it's about. The rightest thing being the word of God. I get it most wrong when I forget who it's for and who it's about. Listen to what 2 Timothy 3, 16 and 17 says. It's a really famous passage. You'll hear it quoted all the time because it says this. God has breathed life into all scripture. It's useful for teaching us what is true. It's useful for correcting our mistakes. It's useful for making our lives whole again. And it's useful for training us to do what's right. By using scripture, the servant of God can be completely prepared to do for us to put into action every good thing. So it says a couple important things. Number one, it says that God's word is breathed. Other translations will say God's word is inspired. It's inspired. Now, that, that inspired means a couple different things. It means uh, like you're, it's, it's, it's uh, encouraged or motivated. And it could mean that, but it doesn't mean that. Did you know that inspire means to breathe in? That you inspire something? 
And in this case, it means to breathe in what God breathed out. So here's what happens. God takes ordinary, sinful, broken, incomplete, wrong men, and he uses them as the vessel to give us the rightest thing we'll ever know. So the brokenness of man becomes the messenger of how broken we are and how right God is. Because I can't think of a better way for you and I to understand how good God is than someone who's completely broken and wrong to tell us that. So for us to know anything good means that it had to be inspired, breathed in, breathe in the presence of God so that we can say anything that represents the presence of God. But all of the word is written to us, and it's really written about us. And you may say, well, the Bible's kind of written about God. So God doesn't need to write the Bible himself for himself, right? He already knows who he is. He has complete knowledge of who he is. He's not telling our story so that he can remember our story. He knows our story. He's not writing it about us. He's writing it to us, for us, so that we can see the brokenness of humanity, the complexity of how wrong we can get it, and our journey back to him. He lets us know just enough about himself to let us know that he's a loving father who allowed us to go into our playpen, completely destroy our own toys, and then say to us, is that the way you want to play? Or do you think there might be a better way? And he shows himself to be the fixer of all that we're breaking. Listen to Hebrews 4.12. It says this. God's word is alive and working. It's active. It's a rhema in the Greek. Rhema word. R-H-E-M-A. It's a rhema living word. It is not stagnant and two-dimensional. It is real and it's multi-dimensional. It's always active and always working and is sharper than any double-edged sword. It cuts all the way into us. I will tell you that cutting is not always a pleasant thing. Where the soul and the spirit are joined, where your intellect, where your mind and your spirit, which is eternal, mix in together, and that cuts it apart. It separates so that we can know the difference between our thoughts and God's thoughts, where the soul and spirit are joined, the center of our joints and bones, and it judges the thoughts and feelings in our hearts. The word of God is a tool for us, to us. Number two is this. I get the rightest thing wrong when I want to fix everyone but me. So I have a lot of knives. This is the one I've been carrying a lot lately. And I use my pocket knives every day, honestly, multiple times a day. And uh, I like this one because I carry my leather bag and this one's got a kind of a flat thing and it doesn't scratch my bag. So I just picked this one recently. It's not even one of my nicest knives. I just really, really like this. And so I use this to open all the Amazon boxes that come to our house. And so I need a knife just for that alone. And I use it to open packages and I use it to cut rope and I use it to cut tape and I use it to cut string that's hanging off of clothes. And I use it to cut zip ties that hold trailer hitch locks onto their packaging, because that's what I did yesterday. And when I use it wrongly, I cut myself with it. So I was cutting through the zip tie, holding the package, and the knife stopped, thankfully, when it hit the bone. And uh, Lisa's still mad that I didn't go to the ER. She gave me a lecture this morning, because it hurt. And I said, she said, I don't even want to hear it. And I said, are you saying if I had gone and gotten stitches, it would not hurt right now? Yeah, because they would have done it right. Because once the doctors give you stitches, then nothing hurts anymore. So there's a lot of good uses for that knife, a lot of practical uses, a lot of purposes for which it was created. 
Cutting myself is not one. That's not a purpose. That's not a good use of that weapon. That tool is to be used on me. And I would say this. The word of God is for a practical, purposeful use. It's meant to do things. It is meant to cut away things. It is meant to, to uh, eradicate things. It is meant to divide things. It is meant to separate things. It is meant to produce things. But we almost never like to feel the pain of using that on ourselves. We love to turn the word of God on the world especially Oh my God, the horrible, sinful, terrible world. We love to take the word of God and beat up the world with it. And can I tell you, that is not what the word of God was written for. It said right there, it is for us, for our equipping, for our change. For We love to use it on other believers. Jesus himself was the one who said, oh, you are so good at pointing out these little specks of dust in your brother's eye, but you're walking around with a telephone pole in your eye. Keep your side of the street clean. Pick up the dog poop in your backyard, and then you can complain about the smell in other people's yards. The word of God is a wonderful tool. Listen to the way Jesus takes on these men who were experts in the word of God, who knew every word, who had studied every sentence, who intellectually retained, they had memorized whole books of what we call Old Testament, but of the scriptures. Listen to what he says to them. He's taking them on specifically. He says, what sorrow awaits you teachers of religious laws and you Pharisees? You're hypocrites. For you like whitewashed tombs, beautiful on the outside, but filled on the inside with dead people's bones and all sorts of impurity. Outwardly, you look like righteous people, but inwardly, your hearts are filled with hypocrisy and lawlessness. These were people who knew the word of God better than any of the people that they taught. They were experts in what every word meant, or at least they thought they were. Jesus points out to them, but you have missed the entire point of all scripture. He said, it has not changed you. You, you paint yourself with the righteousness of knowing the word without ever having let it clean the inside of you out. So you're dead and you're rotten on the inside. You're decaying on the inside but you're a beautiful tomb on the outside. I tell my kids, I don't care what kind of casket you get me. Put me in a big old garbage bag. I don't even care. Bury me 18 inches under the ground. Let the worms get to me. Let the dogs dig me up. I said, but I want a mausoleum on top of the ground. I want like the eternal flame. I want like a hologram going. I want people to walk through the cemetery and go, I don't know who that dude was, but he was clearly loved and uh, very, very important, right? But think about it. Think of all that we do to make this beautiful headstone and below the ground we're rotting away. And that's what Jesus said about knowing the word, but not letting the word change you. And then third, well, let me uh, give you James 12 and 13, James 2, 12 and 13. This is the encouragement we're given. Speak and act as those who are going to be judged by the law that gives freedom. Because judgment without mercy, judgment, comma, without mercy, no mercy will be included in the judgment, will be shown to anyone who has not been Merciful. Don't show mercy. You won't get mercy. Mercy triumphs over judgment. This was James' admonition to us. Actually, it was to Jewish Christians. He actually starts off the book of James saying to the 12 scattered tribes. Well, those are the tribes of Israel. That is the Jewish nation. He says to these Jewish Christians, stop using the law to beat each other up. Start judging each other by the law that sets you free, not the law that keeps you captive. Because listen, if you keep judging people by the law that keeps you captive, you're going to remain captive to judgment. God will not give you mercy if you don't give mercy. And he says that mercy always triumphs over judgment. That is the whole message of the cross. 
is that God chose mercy and grace over judgment. He had us dead to rights. We were sinners. We were rebellious. God could have just wiped the earth clean, opened up the belly of the earth, let us all fall in it, but he didn't. Jesus is the law of grace. And then third and finally is this. I get the rightest thing wrong when I choose law over life. So one of the principles that I frequently teach my team, the staff, to encourage them to teach their teams is that you can't give away what you don't have. So in working with volunteers, we don't want volunteers. So know this, if you say, I would love to serve every weekend, we genuinely love that and appreciate that, but we won't let that happen. We'll work hard, and if I find out it's happening, I'll make sure to work with whatever uh, pastor or director is over you and make sure that you're pulled off the schedule so that you are not working every single weekend and missing out on your opportunity to fellowship and worship and hear the word of God in here. You can't give away anything that you don't have. And if your wells are going dry because you keep giving and giving and giving, but not refilling, that's not good for anyone, right? So we want to keep refilling. We want to keep refreshing. And the principle is true of almost everything. If we have a hostile and unhealthy belief about marriage, then that's what we're going to produce, not only in our own marriage. We're, we're going to give away that which we have. And we're going to act on that which we don't have. If we don't have health in our life, we won't produce healthy things. So if you are dry and you don't have good things happening in your marriage, you are going to sort of regurge unhealthy things. Not just on your own marriage, but you're going to create a legacy in your home for your kids to have an unhealthy marriage. I, I sit down with couples all the time that I'm getting ready to prep for marriage and coaching them and how to take those first steps into their first few months and build a foundation from which they can have a 30-year, 70-year, 80-year marriage. 80 years would be a little, a little much. Lisa's, Lisa's grandpa lived to 100. I mean, his wife didn't, but he did, and so he was, it was still a good marriage. But listen, you'll create a legacy in which your children will sit down with somebody like me, and I'll say, hey, grade your parents' marriage. Tell me about their marriage. And one of them will say, oh, my parents were a three. And another one will say, oh, I mean, they, they, it was good. It was like a six. I've never, I don't think ever in all my years of ministry had anyone say, my, I would give my parents a 10. Which tells me that you and I have more that we can do to give away to those around us. I always tell people that are going through difficulties in their marriage, careful who you let into this process because there are those who will feed the poison that's building in your heart, the bile that's stirring up in your stomach right now, that anger and bitterness and hatred you have towards that other person, th there's going to be those who will fan that flame. So be very careful who you let into this process. Because there are hurting broken people that love company of hurting broken people and will feed your brokenness because it makes them feel just a little less broken. So there's a lot of wrongness that we can feed into and carry around with us. But listen to what Romans 7, 6 says. But we now have been released from the law. For we died to it and no longer captive to its power. Now we can serve God, not in the old ways of obeying the letter of the law, but in the new way of living in the spirit. Let me tell you what that means in the context of what we're talking about right here. He was not talking about sin, that we're captive to sin. He was literally talking about being captive to the law, to the old law that was a series of a bunch of rules that we were mandated to follow in order to somehow work towards righteousness. But we know from scripture that the law is whole. And meaning that the law was built as this vehicle by which you could get to righteousness, if you could get there. But it also says if you broke one aspect of the law, you broke all of the law. 
So this is what people carried around with them, was this book of rules in which they felt constant guilt and condemnation because they were constantly tripping over those rules and failing to do that. So it was starting over at zero again, and they'd have to rebuild and start obeying the law perfectly again. And no one can obey the law perfectly. So it says this, that we give up on trying to follow rules. I want to apologize to you because I have in my earlier years of ministry, not knowing any better because that's what I had been taught, I have passed along the teaching that success in Christianity is about following a strict set of laws and a strict set of rules. All we've done as modern day Christians is figured out a way to reintroduce the law under the guise of grace. And I'm telling you, that is not what God's called us to. That's not what God's released us to. We've been given the law of the spirit. The Bible tells us literally how to do that. Listen to what it says in 2 Corinthians 3, 6, and this is where I'm ending. He is the one, he, capital H, God is the one who helped us tell others about this new agreement, this new covenant. When Jesus came, we left the old covenant, what it took to be righteous through the law. We abandoned that. That's not how we get there. This new agreement uh, about his new agreement to save them. We do not tell them that they must obey every law of God or they'll die. But we tell them there is life for them in the Holy Spirit. The old way, trying to be saved by keeping the Ten Commandments or the law ends. Because remember, the Jews had done a wonderful job of taking the Ten Commandments and turning it into thousands of commandments keep the Sabbath holy. They literally would say, you can't take more than 90 steps on the Sabbath. They called Jesus out for healing on the Sabbath. They were literally turning the law on the son of God, on God in flesh. That's how crazy they had gotten with the law. Says the old way, trying to be saved by keeping the 10 commandment ends in death, but in the new way, the Holy Spirit gives them life. Can I tell you this? That if you're married, I hope the only reason you're not cheating is because there's a covenant in place when you stood and you said, well, that's the rule. That's the law of marriage. I can't cheat. Otherwise, I would do it. I would love to cheat. I'm, I think about cheating all the time. It's just we've made an agreement and I, I want to try and keep that agreement. Because you know that infidelity happens whether there's agreement in place or not, which means it's the heart. It's the heart that compels us to remain inside of a relationship. Our love, the freedom to choose. I'm not married to Lisa for 29 years because I made a commitment 29 years ago and I can't figure out how to break it. But my freedom to walk away is overpowered by my freedom to choose to stay. I choose every day to stay. She's tried to get away, but I choose to keep her in the relationship. I choose to make her stay. And I know right now, and and I was, I didn't even want to say it because... It's literally like, it's, 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 it's like standing near a bonfire and just like splashing around a, a cup of gasoline in my hand. But the Supreme Court ruling overturning Roe versus Wade, I, I've, I've been frustrated because, not because of the way the world reacts, because they only act like those who don't know Christ would react. That's That's going to be what their reaction is. I've been frustrated at the response of followers of Christ who, number one, gloat. That's never a good look for a Christian. So I would ask you to not do that. It's not becoming and Jesus would never, ever do that. And it's not a spiritual victory, by the way. That's a legal victory. We didn't win anything spiritually. And number two is this, when followers of Christ can't differentiate between their, their legal rights and their commandment as a follower of Christ to love God's purpose for everybody, including the unborn. What I would say is this. Legally, 
maybe some ground has been covered. But can I tell you, not a single heart was changed this week. Not a single person began believing in life because of a legal ruling. As followers of Christ, our mandate is to not change laws and legislate people towards righteousness, but rather introduce the freedom that comes through a relationship with Jesus Christ to know God's highest and best for them. And then let every decision they make from there be filtered through, God, what is your highest and best for my life and all that I manage and steward in my life? That's what you and I are supposed to be doing. And if you don't see it that way, I would love to sit down and walk through scripture with you. To see what the mandate and behavior of Jesus was as he walked this earth. What he used his influence to do. There was terrible things that happened. And I want to tell you, not only did abortion exist back then, they would murder children during sacrifices. Born children. Evil existed on on greater levels than it does even today. We haven't capitalized. We haven't cornered the market on terrible things that people do. So, so we, we need to set our, our righteous indignation aside for a second and say, what did Jesus do in the middle of all this craziness? And he worked to win the hearts of people to a loving, grace-filled relationship through him with his father so that they could be changed from the inside out because I've known the most lawless, evil people who through relationship with Jesus Christ began to think talk, act completely differently. Because that's the power of Christ. It's more powerful than law. And so when you and I get to the business of introducing freedom to people through the grace of Christ, instead of the wrath of God through the law of God, we will be more successful at doing what Jesus commanded us to do with his last words. Go therefore and make disciples of all nations, teaching them what I taught you, baptizing them in the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. Do you bow your heads and close your eyes? I'm going to pray this prayer over us. I'm not even sure that we're always self-aware enough to recognize that this is something we should be stepping into and stepping forward for. So God help us all realize when we're getting it wrong because we get it wrong so much more than we get it right. But you've given us your word. It's perfect in showing us how broken we can be. It's perfect in showing us how wrong we get you. David cried out to you and accused you of being distant from him and he pouted and whined. And we see the brokenness of David's perspective on you, not your brokenness as a God to him, but how poorly David saw you. And Job, as he said, oh, I guess you're just going to let me die. I'll be faithful to you even though you're going to let me die. You called him out on it and said, what do you even know about me? Your word is full of example after example after example of how wrong we've gotten it. But you introduce just enough. We could not even know what there is to be known about you. Even if you could put it into volumes, they would be in the trillions upon trillions of books that we could never even get through. And if we could, we wouldn't even understand the very basics about you. But you have revealed yourself to show us what we need to be in you and through you and the path to get to you. So I pray that we just get it right more often than we're getting it wrong. That we were hard to get the right things right and stay away from misusing your word to do the wrong things. We love taking it and swinging it and cutting those around us and we never want to cut ourselves with it. We never want to use the word to expose what's wrong in our lives. Maybe if we just did that, people would trust us. They'd walk up to us. They'd see what it looks like to walk in the humility of Christ and in the grace of of knowing him. So that's my prayer for every one of us today. In Jesus' name, amen. Amen. Well, today is uh, one of those days that we have to say farewell to people that we love and that have been a part of our family. And um, I will tell you, not everybody deserves a send-off. Because sometimes people 
they don't always add value and they don't always buy in and they're not always part of the community and the family. And that's not the case with the two people we're going to be loving out of here today. They both put themselves deep into the culture of Summit, deep into the, to the family, to the community. They have loved us through serving us, making this community a better place and giving themselves um, to make us uh, love each other more and love God more. And both of them served in very uh, meaningful, very practical, but very meaningful ways. And I want to invite Pastor Dave and Lori up here. If Lisa's here, can I have you join me? Can I have the whole staff join me as well? Um, if we have our board members here, I'd love for you guys to step up. We're going to move this out of the way. Thank you. We're going to keep Pastor Dave working until the last minute. And then, um, can I have Jamie and Matt come up? And you can bring the kids too, if you guys want to bring, because they've been a part. Yeah, awesome. You guys scooch up here a little bit, and we're going to have the ant I know it's not your favorite. We we love making this awkward and long and we're just gonna have people stare for a few minutes. Look at Gianna. Little mini mama right there. These guys have all been an enormous, enormous blessing. I, I hate using the word blessing because it's kind of one of those churchy words that doesn't mean anything unless you really mean what it means. And I do mean what it means. Blessing in that they, everything they touched, they, they added blessing to. Does that make sense? That they added worth and value and that came motivated out of love, out of love for you. Um, one thing I think about uh, Pastor Dave is his deep, deep passion for the word of God. And from the time he's been here, he's wanted you to grow in your passion and love and knowledge of the word of God so that it can be transformative in you. And that if there's any book, if there's any knowledge that you can have, that's the knowledge to have. To counter all the knowledge that gets dumped on us voluntarily and involuntarily, that the word of God can cut away all of the nonsense from all of the truth. And Lori has been a really amazing chaplain. I've heard so many people talk about the love and the grace that she shares in her ministry to people. And so their absence here is going to matter. It's going to make a difference and, and we're going to miss them deeply. Uh, Jamie and uh, the whole family, holy cow. <laughs> Cut the online feed right now. We don't, need, we don't need this being recorded. Came to us years ago after having been here already and just being a part of our congregation and uh, moved up to Washington and came back down and just leaned into the family here. And uh, Jamie came on when we were making a transition in our team and I needed administrative help. And she just got in and learned everything that was nearly impossible to learn. And uh, it's not, I, and I'm going to introduce Jess in a minute. If you, all of you could just not scare off all the new people by telling them how hard I am to work for, <laughs> that would be helpful. But having said that, Jamie was a perfect compliment to my personality and, um, I wouldn't say kept me in line, but kept me from getting out of line. How about that? <laughs> and uh, she was a big ally of Lisa's, who uh, they would partner together to keep my life under control. And, um, but not only that, both of these guys have, we, I wish you could sit in on a staff meeting. We start at 1030 and, and unfortunately it rolls till about one o'clock. We're always late to lunch because we have fun together and we laugh together and we enjoy talking with each other and sharing with each other and being a part of each other's lives. 
And uh, we made that work even over the last 18 months as the Antles have been in Reno. And Jamie would come down twice a month and we would zoom in the other times. And we just couldn't stand the idea of that not continuing. So this is a difficult day for all of us. But here's what I believe. That this is a new season of God's highest and best for both of these families. Because what's awaiting the uh, Dodies in Tennessee and what's already begun and in, in, uh, the Ansels establishing their new life in Reno, that's good. We don't ever re resent that or regret that for them. We want to see them move into the next season of God's highest and best. So we're sending them off with our blessing today. We're sending them off with our love today and sending them off with the knowledge that this is always home to them. They can always come back. They can always be here. They'll always get love when they come back. And that when we talk about them behind their backs, it's always going to be good. <laughs> it's always going to be good. And so I'm going to pray for them. And uh, if I could have you just stand to your feet. And um, we, we like to do this. Um, pretend that you get to be on stage here with these amazing people and that you get to put a hand on their shoulder and pray over them. Um, would you do that now? Just extend a hand towards them like you're getting to pray for them. Uh, staff and board, you guys can come put your hands on them. And I want to pray for these guys. Father, we thank you first for the Antles and just getting to see this family uh, grow and thrive and prosper uh, under the banner of Summit for these years, but now getting to see them land in an amazing church there and in new jobs there and new schools and seeing the kids thrive. It's wonderful to see those who you love do well. It's wonderful to see them happy. It's wonderful to see them thriving. And we don't resent that, God. We don't say, well, if you're not doing it here, we don't want to see you do it anywhere. We are thankful that you've moved them into this next season. And we pray it's even a better time than they, that they're even uh, more involved in their church there, that they're even more loved there, that uh, they feel even more appreciated there because, God, we always want increase, not decrease. And so we thank you for all of that. It's going to hurt us, God. Our, our hearts are hurting because we have to let go. But we do this, God, blanketing them in our love and sending them off, letting them know that family still is right here in Lincoln and that they always have a safe place to land to just be hugged and loved on and told how important and valuable they really are. God, for the Dodies, we thank you for an amazing ministry, for their hearts that um, have spilled out through their ministry expressions, that you've given them a place of influence and that influence has changed and shaped lives for the better, that they have increased, God, our love for your word, our discipline in studying it, but more importantly, our discipline in allowing it to change and transform our lives. Because just knowing it's not enough, God, just hearing the word's not enough, but being doers of the word, that's the ministry you've given to this family. And I pray that as soon as they land, that your spirit speaks to them, they find a community of faith that fits them well and they fit well. And God, they're going to begin to uh, use their giftings to influence that community and increase their love for you and your word. And I pray that they would find friends quickly, God. It's tough moving into new communities, but find friends quickly. And those friendships would be deep and meaningful and ones they can trust early on. And I thank you for all of these things. God, believing for both of these families to increase in your blessing financially, maritally, with their family, with their influence in every way, God. Add favor to all that they do and they touch. In Jesus' name, we believe for it. We thank you for it in advance as if it's already happened. And we all say, amen. 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 Yeah, give them both just a huge hand. Such a special time together. I know I've appreciated all of the ministry that Pastor Dave has brought to this church with the gear groups and really putting in a strong structure. So I'm excited to send him and to send Lori off. Um, but next week, make sure you join us. Come in a service, get a special refreshing treat, get an awesome message from a guest speaker. We're so excited to have you. And remember, you can follow us all week long. You can follow us on Instagram, you can like us on Facebook, and you can subscribe on YouTube. I hope you have an amazing week. Bye.